Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, it's part of the search of the shared dream. The Bay Area Jewish community is partnering with Israelis in building a shared society in Israel. My name is Barak Luzon. I'm the Israel Office Director for the San Francisco Bay Jewish Community Federation and Endowment Fund. I was born and raised in Israel, but spent the summer of 91 at Camp Swig, not far from here, as a young Sofe, as a young scout. And as Gidi said, really, like I came here, you know, in the, like an Israeli who knows everything about Israel, but figure out, you know, actually happening about Judaism and what Jewish life might be. So came back a Jew, really. For me, it was a formative experience that influenced my path and my future. I, um, in, in, and in my role today, I am standing on this bridge between the two communities, the Bay Area Jewish community and the Israeli community. Um, who are both going through quite dramatic changes. And with my friends and partners and colleagues, we think of ways to bring these uh, two communities together as both communities are now authoring their next chapters. Authoring the next chapter of Zionism and of Jewish life outside of Israel requires facing the fast-changing realities, engaging in adaptation processes, and the belief that this is not just a covenant of faith, believe go out, but rather it's a covenant of destiny. We're destined to be together. Today, we have the opportunity to hear from three leaders who are not only committed to serve their own communities in Israel and within the American Jewish community, but rather to work forcefully for the greater common good. Arthur Slepian will facilitate the conversation, Sigal Kanatowski and Elisheva Mazia will share their work they do, their aspirations, and the challenges they face. The relationship between the three, she didn't see. The relationship between the, these three people on the stage today goes a few years back. Under the Federation's mission to strengthen Israel as a pluralistic and democratic society with equal opportunities for all its citizens, Arthur Slepian, now in his role as the Federation Chair of the Israel Committee, oversees the programs we support in Israel and is deeply involved in finding ways to support their work on the ground. Elisheva and Sigal are both CEOs of organizations who have been Federation's partners and grantees for many years, New Spirit and Olimbia. They both were also Gvanim Fellows, a Federation's initiative to promote Jewish pluralism in Israel. In the session today, we will uh, be focusing on the changes that are going on in Israeli society and the potential work that can be done by both communities to address them. The new makeup of Israel of the Israeli society with the challenges and opportunities embedded in is very well articulated in this short videography coming from the President of the United States of Israel, President Ruby Rivlin. President Rivlin has set, a, has set at the top of his agenda the need to build bridges between the different groups to make up, uh, that make up the Israeli society. Let's take a few minutes to see this videography and then we um, and will introduce our guests. Yeah, 
עילית, לא רק שהם לא נדרשים, אלא הם גם מתחנכים לתפיסה שונה בתכלית לגבי ערכי היסוד ואופייה הרצוי של מדינת ישראל. האם תהיה זאת מדינה חילונית וליברלית, יהודית ודמוקרטית? האם תהיה זאת מדינת הלכה יהודית? או דמוקרטיה הלכתית, האם תהיה זאת מדינה כל אזרחיה או דומיה, שבט, 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 באופן דומה, בכל שבט, בדוגמת השבט התקשורתית שלו, העיתונים, אותם הוא קורא, ערוצי הטלוויזיה בהם הוא צופה, כך, בכל שבט, גם ערים משלו, תל אביב, אום אל פחם, אפרת ובני ברק. הסדר הישראלי החדש הוא מציאות בעלת השלכות מרחיקות לכת על החוזן הלאומי של מדינת ישראל, על העתיד של כולנו. כדי ליצור תקווה מוכרחים להכיר את העובדות, הדחקה או מאבק לא יריבו. כולנו, חרדים וחילונים, דתיים וערבים, כאן, כולנו כאן כדי להישאר כאן, ועלינו להבין איך אנחנו עושים את זה יחד. אם חפצי חיים אנחנו, אם חזון המדינה היהודית והדמוקרטית הוא חלום חיינו, מצאת נפשנו, הרי שאנו נדרשים היום להישיר מבט למציאות הזאת. וזאת, מתוך מחויבות עמוקה למצוא יחד תשובות לשאלות, מתוך נכונות לסרטט יחד כל שבטי ישראל חזון משותף של תקווה ישראלית. הסדר הישראלי החדש דורש מאיתנו היום לעבור מהתפיסה המקובלת של רוב מיעוט לתפיסה חדשה של שותפות, שותפות בין המגזרים השונים בחברה הישראלית. ישנם ארבעה יסודות שעליהם השותפות הזאת מוכרחה לעמוד. הראשון הוא בתחושת הביטחון של כל מגזר, בכך שהכניסה לשותפות הזאת אינה כרוכה בוויתור על מרכיבי היסוד של זהותו. החרדי, החילוני, הדתי או הערבי אינם יכולים להרגיש שציפור נפשם נמצאת בסכנה או תחת איום כלשהו. היסוד השני הוא האחריות המשותפת. כאשר אף שבט אינו מיעוט, אף צד לא יוכל להימלט מנסיעה באחריות לגורלה ועתידה של מדינת ישראל וכלל החברה בישראל. היסוד השלישי הוא הוגנות ושוויון. כדי להבטיח את השותפות בינינו, יהיה עלינו להבטיח שאף אזרח אינו מופנה לרעה או לטובה. תוקף השתלחותו המגזרית. כן, והיסוד הרביעי והמאתגר לכולם הוא יצירת הישראליות המשותפת. הפסיפס הישראלי המתאבד איננו גזירה, אלא הזדמנות אדירה. הזדמנות הטומנת בחובה עושר תרבותי, השראה, אנושיות ורגישות. אם נאמין שלא נגזר עלינו, אלא נועדנו לחיות יחד, נוכל, נוכל גם נוכל לאתגר. יהיה עלינו להבין כיצד נראה החינוך לשותפות בהינתן מערכות חינוך מופרטות. כיצד מנהלים משק ומגזר ציבורי שמצטיינים בגיוון תעסוקתי. כיצד נראה תקשורת, תקשורת שמצליחה לשמש גם כפלטפורמה משותפת. אקדמיה שאינה מתפשרת על איכות אבל יודעת לייצר סביבה תרבותית רגישה. פוליטיקה ושיח פוליטי שמביאים בחשבון את הרגישויות והיסודות של השותפות. ביסוסה של השותפות הזאת היא משימה אדירה. אני עומד כאן לפניכם מתוך תחושה עמוקה שהחברה הישראלית זקוקה היום לקריאת השואה. אני קורא היום לכולכם, התגייסו יחד איתי לאתגר. רק כך, יחד ובשותפות, נוכל לחדש תקווה ישראלית. Israeli Hope by the President uh, of Israel. I want to introduce to you Arthur Stepien. He's the founder and the executive director of the Wider Bridge, a pro-Israel organization that works to deepen the connection between the LGBT communities of Israel and North America. The Wider Bridge was founded in 2010 and staff in New York, Chicago, San Francisco, and Los Angeles, and it brings its program to cities across North America. Uh, there are more on Arthur on, uh, on, on, in, in, the, in the binders, uh, but I would like to also kind of uh, briefly introduce Elisheva and Sigal. Elisheva uh, Mazia serves as the CEO of the Jerusalem-based non-profit organization, New Spirit, which works to keep creative young adults in Jerusalem to, in order to help Israel's capital be a thriving and pluralistic city. She um, helped found New Spirit while a student at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and then many, many more things. Elisheva publishes co columns for the Idiot Achronot newspaper, if you happen to see it. Sigal Kanatovsky is the executive director of Olim Beyachan, an organization working towards the successful integration 
of Ethiopian Israelis into the mainstream society. Prior to that, she served as the organization's director of development and, director, and deputy director. She served also as a Jewish agency representative on numerous short-term assignments abroad, visit, visiting Jewish congregations all over the world. I'm really happy that you guys are here with us and for the opportunity to hear from the Sheta from the ground. So I'm going to take this out and we'll invite you guys to bring her chair. Cheers here. Great. And I'm here with two hats on. I'm the executive director of a wider bridge that works to build connections between the LGBT communities of Israel and North America. And I'm also on the board of the Federation and the chair of our Israel committee. So I want to talk about a little bit about both of those things. And I'll start with a wider bridge. And we have, I think maybe the best way to describe what we do is that we, we have a model or a slogan that tries to encompass what our objectives are. And that slogan is equality in Israel, equality for Israel. And I want to talk about each of those two pieces. When we say equality in Israel, we mean that our dream for Israel, our shared vision of what Zionism is about, is one that is about diversity and inclusion. We imagine an Israel where we as LGBT people in the United States, Jews or non-Jews, can come to Israel and feel like we are truly a part of the fabric of the society. Uh, and I think one. <laughs> Direct challenge to President Obama. Sorry. My, my podcast apps to go off on its own. Uh, I think one of the interesting aspects of this work with the LGBT community is that while it might seem like it's kind of a small niche, in fact, one, one aspect of it is that. It runs across all four of the tribes that we saw here. Uh, every, every community in Israel, every tribe, every sub-tribe has some representation of LGBT people. And so when we bring missions of LGBT leaders from North America to Israel, we meet with secular Israeli leaders, we meet with religious LGBT leaders, we meet with Ethiopian LGBT leaders, um, we meet with Arab LGBT leaders, and sometimes we even meet with Haredi, a former Haredi. Um, or in the LGBT community. So this is an identity that, it, it, in fact, when the president said that these four tribes never meet, well, at Jerusalem Open House or in some gay bar, they in fact do meet. Because one of the one of the few areas in which the tribes come together is in the is in the intersection of the LGBT community. Um, so that so and we bring and we meet with LGBT groups and leaders not only in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem but in Be'er Sheva and Kiryat Shemona and Afula. There is LGBT life all over the country. So in a way, as we take people to Israel and help them see the country through this, what seems like this very specific lens, we really are also, in a sense, showing them the entire country. Um, and, and we do it in a way that, as I say, I think most people in North America, if they have an image of LGBT life in Israel, if they have any image at all, it may be this image that there are handsome young guys on the beach in Tel Aviv. And in fact, there are handsome young guys, <laughs> the gay and straight. Um, but um, it's our goal to really show people the whole, the whole fabric of the rainbow. And it's not, it's, it's way more than that, and it's way more beautiful than that. Uh, and so just as, I mean, as one example, just, just, just a few months ago, we brought to the US the leaders of an organization called Kala, which is the organization that has just developed in the last couple of years for the Ethiopian LGBT community in Israel. And we brought them to six cities around the country and to meet with, with Jew, Jewish leaders and people of color and to, and to tell their really fascinating story about what it's like to be, to be in Israel. Uh, so that's equality for Israel, I mean, equality in Israel. Equality for Israel, that we want Israel to be treated fairly in the global LGBT community, in the community of nations in general. Um, we're, not, we're not a political lobbying organization. We're not the gay APAC or the gay J Street. 
that we're happy to work with both of those groups because they are they both have strong constituents of LGBT people. Um, but we are political in the sense that we support Israel's right to exist as a Jewish and democratic state, and we oppose the movement for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. When we started a wider bridge six years ago, the only organizations in the community in the country that had there were LGBT and talked about Israel were groups that had names like Israel, LGBT, Queers United Against Israeli Apartheid or Queers United Against Israeli Terrorism. And we wanted to be an alternate voice. Uh, and we wanted to present a more positive view of Israel and to help make the concept of Zionism more relevant and more meaningful for our community here today. As you might imagine, the LGBT community in North America, and particularly here in the Bay Area, leans to the left. That's, that's very understandable. And so do we lean to the left when it comes to issues like equal rights and marriage equality and opposing racism. Uh, but we also refuse to be defensive or tentative or embarrassed about our care and concern for Israel. We want to support people on the ground, like people who are going to be here in a few minutes, who are working to make Israel a better place. But it doesn't diminish the love and the pride that we feel for the Israel that exists today. Uh, and, I think, and I think that sentence, that we want to make Israel a better place, but, if, but, we, but we have this great pride in the Israel that exists today, is also true about the work that we do in Federation. Uh, and I want to say a little bit about that. I don't want to switch gears and say a little bit about that. Um, because we in the Fed, we in here in the San Francisco Federation, we do our work in Israel a little bit differently than most other federations around the country. Uh, and one is that most federations just simply send a few big grants to organizations like the Joint Development Committee or the or Jaffe or Bart, and they sort of made up those folks do the work. And we have a different philosophy. We have staff on the ground in Israel led by Barack, and we want to be in a much more personal relationship with the organizations that we are supporting. Um, and we also think it's important for us to be developing the most talented leaders, entrepreneurs, innovators in Israeli society that are working for change. And so that's why we, we choose to, to sort of, we have a large portfolio of grantees and we choose to have a much more intimate relationship with them and to be much more involved with their work and also to bring their stories back to our community. And so we have two amazing examples of that here today, with Sheva and Sigal. And so now I'm going to have a little conversation with them, and then we'll open it up for questions. So um, just first of all, you're both doing such amazing work, and it's been such a privilege for me to get to know you and your work over the last few years. So I'm hoping that you could just each take a little bit of time to talk about your own journey toward activism and social entrepreneurship and what it is that your own organizations do. Sure, please. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Elisheba. Um, I was born and raised in Nalal, it's a small shop in the Israel Valley in the north of Israel, um, which I'm, I'm very proud of. And my personal story starts actually um, in the States. My grand grandmother was American and then uh, about 90 it's not about, it's exactly 94 years ago, she heard a lecture of someone from the Zionist movement that came to the States to recruit people. And uh, she came back home, said to her husband, I'm living here, I'm taking our two uh, small kids, and I'm moving to Israel, and you're staying here. I think she wanted to divorce anyway, but she's just a physical as an excuse. And she came right to Naalala, and it was almost a year after the Mushab was founded, but she considered as one of the founders that he was still um, uh, like in the beginning of, of the Zionist movement and establishment of Naalala. And it was a crazy decision to come from the wealthy, comfortable states to uh, dry swamps in Israel. And I think she was looking for, for exciting challenges. To some extent, I think, because my parents has nothing to do with social activism, I think this is uh, kind of what I took in my genes. And 13 years ago, I decided to uh, move to Jerusalem to be a student. And it was a very weird decision. First of all, because again, Nala was a very, today, it's a very comfortable place to live in it. 
uh, but also because it was right after the Second Intifada and Jerusalem was a very uh, dangerous place to live at. But also because the population in Jerusalem then is very diverse. That's exactly what William Hitt speaks about. And it was a very uncommon decision for uh, someone that grew up in a very classic Jewish secular home. And I decided to do that because I was excited by the diversity. <coughs> and um, I think, um, I'll speak about it in a minute, but I'll, so, so I moved to be a student and then I met a few friends in university and we were all very much worried about both the future of Jerusalem but also the future of Israel. And we said, we want to do something with Generation Y. We established New Spirit, the non-for-profit organization, building communities of young people that we want them eventually to stay in Jerusalem because the average uh, young Jerusalem might most likely move to Tel Aviv. As Ruby Levin said, this is the Jewish secular tribe uh, city. And, and this whole uh, community of young people that we work with are the engine for economic growth in, in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is facing a huge brain drain of young people. Um, so over the past 13 years, we engaged more than 3,000 young people in a number of programs and communities that eventually get those people to not just live in the city and create in the city, but also uh, be involved. And what drives me is, is exactly what Ruby Rivlin spoke about. So when I um, see the data about where Israel used to be, where Israel is heading, all I think about is that we have three ways of, of see that because when, well, I'm, I'm dealing with those numbers for a few years now and every time I, told, I tell my Tel Aviv friends or my high school friends the, the, the data, they are shocked because a lot of the people still feel like we're 30 years ago in a Jewish secular country with three minorities. But the fact is that Israel is changing and we just keep ignoring it. And as I see it, there, there are three ways to, um, to treat it. One is to say, and there are many people that say, I don't want to live in a country like that. And I think that a lot, um, the number one reason why people leave Israel is not because of the economy. I think it's because of that. They feel they don't want to live in a country like that. The second thing that you can do is to say, well, I'm, I'm terrified by that, but I don't want to leave Israel, I want to speak Hebrew, I want to stay with my family, so you go to live in your uh, tribe city. And this is exactly what he mentioned. If you're Jewish secondly, you go to Tel Aviv, and if you're Haredi, you go to Nebuchadnezzar. And I think what we invented in Jerusalem is the third option, is to actually deal with that and be excited by this challenge, because my grand grandmother was excited by the Israel challenge and to develop creative solutions for this issue. And this is why I chose to be in Jerusalem, because Jerusalem kind of predicts the future of Israel. Current demography in Jerusalem is pretty much what we'll have in, in Israel in 10, 15 years from now. And this is why we made a big decision, and I'll finish with that. So, so New Spirit, for 10 years, worked mainly with secular and modern orthodox young people, because we felt this is what will drive the economy. And, you know, this is the people that want University and they pay taxes and everything. And in many ways, we felt like it's a zero sum game. So, if we'll have, we'll attract more secular people to Jerusalem, we'll be able to fight the ultra Orthodox and Arab populations that are getting big. And then, about two years ago, we built uh, our next five year strategy, and we all kind of started a huge shift in how we see that and, and personally. If we understand today that the Arab and ultra-Orthodox communities in Jerusalem, first of all, they have a big force, of the, a big part of people who are young, creative, dynamic, go to restaurants, coffee shops, bars, and everything. But more, more of that, we really think that this is the only way to, as I said, really um, develop creative solutions for the fact that we live in the same city. And it became a big part of my organization's mission. So past year and a half, we started to work a lot with old orthodox, a little bit with Arabs, because it's, it's much more difficult. Uh, but we engaged more than 100 old orthodox in the past year, um, in different programs in, in, the, in the communities. And I think it's very exciting, because what we see in Jerusalem is a shit, like uh, very slow, but you see it. It's a shift for how people think 
about the fact that they live in a diverse city, in a diverse country. And I, I, I'm very optimistic about it. Good. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Sigal Kratovsky. I'm married in Manor 4, living in Tsukhin, part of Prasaba in Israel. Uh, my uh, motivation to be involved with uh, social activism is start um, 40 years ago in my village in Ethiopia, where I was born. I understood that, I think, two years ago, when I took my daughter, Shahar, uh, to, uh, uh, two years ago, she celebrated her bat mitzvah. And I decided to her bat mitzvah to take her to a uh, road trip to Ethiopia. And these two weeks that we traveled there, we had the you know, opportunity to village in my parents' uh, village, the, the village that I was born in. And uh, from the closed city to this village, we drove four hours. And we get into this, this village, beautiful village, get it uh, in a beautiful area, uh, surrounded by volcanic mountains. And I stand there with my daughter, and was in front of us, the river that all my childhood story are based on. And look at this beautiful place, and many questions that you know come up to my mind. Um, why? Why my parents live this beautiful life? nature life and start journey that no one promised them that they will finish at the end, that everybody, everything will be okay on this journey. Um, um, how they, you know, could danger my life, my living life and start this journey. Uh, and also the parents, I was there with my daughter and I couldn't understand how my, you know, parents took this responsibility as the parents endangered their children's life and start the way that, you know, they said before. No one promised that everybody will be okay. And I think uh, two weeks after I went we back to Israel, I asked my mother this question. And, um, you know, how they could endanger my life, my children's life, and why did they live uh, this beautiful life? They had, a, they were rich pe uh, people there, they weren't uh, poor people. And, you know, and how they could from this remote village in northwest Ethiopia, could dream about Jerusalem and you know start this way, and by very simple answer of my mother and to why I'm doing what I'm doing today, she said, she said, what kind of question is that? She said, we live for Jerusalem. Our life mission and goal was Jerusalem. So when we heard that there's a way to Jerusalem, so it wasn't a question of if we'll do that. It was a question of how we're going to do that. And I think. Um, this very simple question uh, answer I understood why I'm so involved in, with all my life in uh, uh, civil uh, activism and to make Israel a better life for everybody and in a way also to uh, tell the right narrative, the right story of Ethiopian Jews in Israel to say those people that they were like visionary like Herzl and others they had you know this dream to uh, 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 to bring their family to, to, to Jerusalem and um, no one, you know, promised that they choose to live their life and their safe zone and to come to Jerusalem and to Israel. And I think, in a way, what we are doing today in Olympia Yachas is to tell the right story, the right narrative of the Ethiopian community in Israel. Say, Olympia Yachas has existed 10 years, working one side with the Ethiopian youngest uh, university students and graduates to help them to suit a job in the Israeli market, give them the tools that any other Israeli has through their, you know, uh, uh, parents or uh, uh, parents of their uh, friends of their parents, and give them this equal opportunity to find their way to the Israeli uh, market and society, but at the same time uh, to say to work with the you know, employers and the, uh, volunteers and the people that leading the Israeli society and the Israeli market, and to open up their eyes and to make uh, from close face-to-face face to face, these uh, Ethiopian Israeli uh, um, um, excellence, ambitions, youngers, and through them to be exposed to the Ethiopian Israeli part in Israel. And in our work, we are, our statement, very clear statement to say we came to address problem of the Israeli society, not problem of the Ethiopian community. Because I think we all of us know that if in a normal way, uh, no one of those Ethiopian younger would need this help, special organization to find a job. If if we if he or she um, could find uh, this uh, opportunity and 
10 years that we are existing, working with thousands of uh, Ethiopian university students, graduates that are working and they are in the forefront of the Israeli market, and thousands of uh, employers that were partners with us and working with us. And they are, they are our partners. They're, they're not, some of them are working at Olympia without salary. And I think this is like uh, what, uh, you know, to see my children and to, uh, to see this, uh, this uh, partners give me the, uh, you know, uh, the, the hope that uh, something will be better in a few years in Israel. Thank you. So, so I want to talk with each of you a little bit about Zionism. Elisha, you're, you're working to make change in a very complicated place in, the, in Jerusalem, in a city that everybody has an opinion about. Um, and the people say that you know, the Zionists of old were milking cows and draining swamps, and the new Zionists are building communities. But what, is it, what does it mean to be a Zionist in Jerusalem today? So I believe that, in general, mm -hmm. what, what happened in Israel when, again, 94 or 100 years ago, people came and there was nothing, and we needed to, buy, to build the infrastructure, the roads, the buildings, to drive swamps, to do the physical thing. And it sounds like a hard, like a hard task, but the fact is that I think that our, cur our contemporary task is much more complicated and um, and difficult than it used to be uh, 100 years ago. So I, in my theory, people were very much focusing on building stuff. So nobody really invested time and energy in thinking about how to build a society. Where, on the other way, I think what happened in the States is fascinating because the Jewish community here didn't, didn't need to dry any swamps. So the, the Jewish community really invested time and energy to build um, a real society. This is why the whole system of Jewish federations and GCCs and Jewish community is amazing. And we don't have nothing, something, something like that in Israel. And I think what happened that on the last 20 years, we finally realized that somebody needs to build a society in Israel, especially because Israel becomes more and more diverse. And when we were all looking pretty much the same, with the three minorities, but most of Israel looks pretty much the same, it was you know, pretty easy to, uh, to live in the same country. But I think that our current challenge is to really take different populations and turn them into society. And this is what it means to build a more um, um, cohesive or diverse communities. And I think that really this is like the number one task of, of, of the Zionistic movement at our times. And by the way, this is why I'm in Jerusalem, because I think, I really feel like I'm in, I live in the for, for, for forefront of the Zionistic movement and the Zionistic uh, needs and tasks. And I think that like, our main goal for the next uh, few decades is to really allow those very different people to feel part of the same home and the same society. And uh, I think this is part of what Herzl meant when he spoke about Israel, that focusing on the launch of buildings. Thank you. So, so you got, first of all, I, wanna, I guess I want to take the opportunity to share a little story just because as I mentioned, back in April, I had the opportunity to travel around the country with three young leaders from this group called Kala, which is for LGBT Ethiopians. And, um, and they were all born in Israel, in their, in their 20s. And, um, and they talked about the, some of the persecution and oppression, some of the problems that the Ethiopian community is having in, in Israel. But they also said, they said, we are so grateful that our parents and grandparents had the courage to make the journey, and that they gave us a challenge. It's, they gave us the challenge to make Israel better. It's not that's, they, they did their job to get us there, and now it's our job mm -hmm. to make the place better. Um, but I want to ask you that a lot of the challenges that, that your community faces in Israel seem similar to some of what the African American community experiences here, whether it's discrimination, segregation, uh, unfair treatment by the police, etc. There have been major protests in Israel a lot of that last year. Um, and in this country, it has sparked a very interesting conversation about patriotism. And even and including symbolic things like, like should should people who feel oppressed stand or sit for the national anthem. 
And I guess Zionism is, in a way, sort of an expression of Israeli patriotism. So I guess my question for you is, either for you personally or if you want to speak for some more of your community, um, what does Zionism mean for you when you when you hear Hatikva? What is how does your community see itself in the hope of that song? So as you understood from me from uh, the first question, I think for. In a way, there are similar things between the African American situation and in Ethiopian Israel. That is a huge uh, uh, difference because, because the Ethiopian Israeli choose to come to Israel. They came to Israel because it's their home. Okay, uh, they are there to stay. We are not going anywhere. So, um, and for us, Israel is the only language, we, uh, a, a country, and Hebrew is the only language. So we don't have other place. So for, even it's so. Uh, um, difficult and there's challenges that we are facing and going through for the last 30 years in Israel. I think Zionism, for, by my eyes, to stay there, to say we are here, although all these challenges, okay, and to say, uh, and in a way, you know, if Zionism 50 years ago was kibbutzim and build bridges, today Zionism, I think that the social, um, um, uh, social civil so, uh, uh, society organization replaced the kibbutzim place. And um, so, but in the Ethiopian Israeli community eyes in Israel today, although the, all the difficulties that we are going through, Israel is the whole place. And they stand the anthem and respect the country, and they, you know, call it, it's there. We're not, you know, we're, we're not looking for other place to go because, you know, uh, there is a segregation issues in Israel. We say, okay, you know, we'll stay here and we'll make the better, the better, uh, this place better for our kids. We work in this one where I'm doing what I'm doing in Olympia and other kids and those uh, kids that you met say we want our kids and other kids in Israel grow, growing in a healthy society and a healthy environment. So in order to be in this place, we work. We should work today and not to wait and say the time will do. You know, the health and will better another uh, uh, 50 years. Um, and also uh, regarding the Ethiopian community in Israel, I think the the color is issue. And if the color is an issue, the color will be stand under 100 years. So, and the, the color is upheld by the uh, uh, non-Ethiopian Israeli. I think this is one of the uh, uh, characterizes that they, you know, we are judging by uh, Ethiopian Israeli. So let's work on it and, and change the misperception of the way that the public in Israel seeing and judging Ethiopian Israeli. And I think so. It's in a way it's working on both sides of the coin all the time. One side to you know. To help these younger Ethiopian Israelis, the majority was born here and help them to feel at home. But on the other side, to work with the uh, Israeli society, non-Ethiopian side, to say, hey, you know, we, we are you are not doing a favor to get them to integrate the Israeli society. They are there just like you, and to change the misperception that exists uh, related to the Ethiopian community. Okay, thank you. So I feel like we definitely have reached 3.0 in our discussion of Zionism here. Why don't we see if there are questions from all of you? I think I, I'm curious about a larger question that I would love your wisdom on, which is we know it's not just the four tribes. We know that Ethiopians or Yemeni or other groups are kind of separate and so forth. We know that when my sons were in the Israeli uh, Defense Forces, and as we talked about, they would take their friends from Ethiopia to a bar who also served in the Israeli Army, and some bars refused to allow them to come in. So racism is, is very present. You know, one of my sons who just me from Harvard, who's a student at Harvard, all the Israelis were welcome to take a boat ride. And they came up with their friends, an Israeli, an Israeli Arab. He was not allowed to go on the boat, but all everybody else was. So we know there are challenges. The question I have, and two of them actually, one is the national anthem as an example. Are there symbols that may have to be changed in a Israel 3.0, such as the national anthem? It's very controversial. But the other one is, what is the unifying story? And not just how we together, what's the unifying story that will make all these various groups want to stay and stay in Israel? What are the groups and whatever it is? But what's the unifying story now? Before it was survival, Holocaust, and so forth. What is it now that will keep all these diverse groups want to stay in Israel? That's what I'm curious about, so I love the answer. <laughs> um, well, I'll be like extremely optimistic or, or even naive. I really think, I, I 
though I'm not religious at all, but I really believe in the notion of all going. Like I, I know some people, Light my mother, what? Light onto the oh, sorry, uh, all oh, it's, it's a term that I can send you. My, my, my mother thinks it's a very racist thing to yeah. say, and very arrogant. And, but I really think that Israel's current challengers are something that uh, America is facing, European countries are facing. And I really feel that um, you know, our next big challenge is that. And, and, I, and this is why I think that we should all be excited to create this new narrative that means that we are stuck in the same country, but we don't want to just be seg keep on being segregated, but we want to be um, excited by the differences. And the reason I believe in it, because this is a change that happened to me. If you would ask me five years ago, I was very much focused on um, expanding the power of my tribe in Jerusalem. We did, so my, my tribe is the Jewish secular. I, my organization did a lot of cultural events on Shabbat in the city center, and we fought, we fought with everyone we can to, and I'm not doing that anymore, and I really changed what I'm doing, and it's not just because I wanna be okay with everybody, it's because I really, um, I'm going every month on Thursday night to have Chilti Mashari as a, it's like a, it's like a fun night. And and I have a lot of old Rathabot friends, and this is today, like, a lot of people keep telling me, well, you know, eventually you go back to Tel Aviv because this is, you know, your, your place. And I keep telling them, and I really believe in it, it's not my home anymore. I'm not excited about living in a, you know, I love San Francisco, and every time I hear it, I really love it. But I really don't feel at home here because I think it's it's uh, it's not a reality, and and I think the opportunity to live in a place with people that are really different from you is something that we can all be excited by. And I think that our new joint narrative should be to be excited by the other. And by the way, San Francisco is a good example to that. So saying something opposite to what I just said, but I, I think it's both. And it's, uh, so I, I, I hope more people in Israeli society would feel like our, our joint narrative is to teach the world how to live in the country. I think today there's more awareness uh, than five years ago about this like, common life and to create this common food of everybody in Israel. Um, as a religious person, I believe in to be or not to be, but I think we are by far, we are not there. We have a lot you know, to do, and we will be considered today, I will say, to the society to be or not we, I mean, and yeah. by, which, but we are not there. Wait, and your answer. So, I guess I would say, I, mean, I, feel, I don't know if you heard Gideon Green's thing. I thought there were four areas, there yeah. were ones that fourth one. Right, so I think, well I guess I'm not sure there, there will ever be one unifying narrative. I think what, what Giddy was saying was that the Jewish people have always had four stories in a way, and that at different times and places, pieces of those stories, but the fact that, the fact that all four stories exist is a part of why we actually still exist as a people 3,500 years from now, with so many other ethnic groups and religions and other kinds of people that disappeared from the face of the earth. Uh, but there's only one place, there's only one Israel, only one, there's only one opportunity that we have for this manifestation of Jewish people to, to exist. And so uh, I think that sort of all of these stories, they, they, they sort of require that we all commit ourselves to that project in one way or another. Because there aren't going to be four Israels, there's only going to be one. Uh, and, and even and those of us, even, I also think that um, it's important that there be a strong diaspora. I think, I think another part of Gideon's book is that part of what has sustained the Jewish people and kept us, from, kept us in survival mode is that we have been spread out all over the world. And so even, even when all the Jews in Europe were killed, or most of them, it only, there still were a great many of us around to sort of help pick up the pieces. Uh, and so but I don't think, I don't think it's, it's a requirement that we all make Aliyah, but I think it's a requirement that we all be in some significant relationship with this Jewish homeland.
company. So that would be for you getting the partnership model, it sounds like to me. Yes. Okay. Other questions? So today's theme is the Zionism 3.0, and as we know, the majority of Israel are Muzachim, Jews of color. And a lot of the times when we talk about Zionism, when we talk about Ashkenazi and there, and Zionism related to Ashkenazi, we, we don't talk about the Mizrahi Zionism and what happened there and why did they leave the why did they leave Ethiopia? Why did they leave Iraq for Yemen? And they have a lot of stories and for some reason I feel like in education here in America and also in Israel, it's like Mizrahim are just wiped out completely in their story of Zionism and their history. So how do you think we can um, empower our government in America and in Israel to start education? I, I know that Vitone has done like curriculum now. So it's just getting started, but how do you think we can talk about it? Because even here, um, when we talked about Zionism, I didn't hear one Zionist that they discussed. So that's just something that I wanted to point out. Say. Yeah, I would also say, I think it's also part of the, what you just said is also part of the problem. And part, it's certainly also part of the problem on the left of how the left sees Israel. Because there is this simplification of the story of Israel that is, Israel are, is white European colonialists that are oppressing Palestinian people of color. And there's so much that's inaccurate about that story, but one of the main things that's inaccurate about that story is that more than half of Israel are themselves people of color, but probably even more of color than the Palestinian people in some ways. Um, and so until we integrate all of those stories into the new story of Zionism, we're, it, 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 it makes us, it makes the story more, it opens that story up, makes it more vulnerable to these accusations about racism and oppression and other things that really, you know, that really don't tell the full story of, of what the history of the people are. I, I think also, kind of, you know, the president uh, referred to the tribes, like four tribes, but actually, as you mentioned before, of course, there are some, you know, people are, you know, feeling, uh, feeling belong to sub-tribes or communities and so on. The reason, by the way, he did it is, uh, is, is, is quite important is uh, because of the fact that we have four different public school systems in Israel. We have siloed public school systems. We have a, pub a public school system to each one of these, of these tribes, of these streams. This is why I was kind of referring to it, because as you saw in the movie, he said, tell Raleigh that our kids are, that like we're raising our kids apart from each other. But actually, each tribe, each school system, Educated to a different vision of Israel, different you know image of Israel, and so on. So the Mizrahi, I would say, kind of sub uh, identity or identity. I'm sure, I, I guess you know, because it, it sounds like you are kind of involved. It has become more and more vocal in the in the last uh, few years, and I think that that's actually what's now happening in Israel. There are more voices out there in the in, on the public square, like really, the people are voicing out their own identities. It's kind of a, I feel like it's a process of kind of returning to who we, who you are before you come to the public square and try to you know uh, create a dialogue or build a cohesive society, but rather who you are, what's your heritage is, who, who are your parents, what, what was the village you came from, being proud, being proud of this village, really hearing the story of your mother, in order to come to come to the public square and talk to, to others. I think it's a, actually I think it's a an amazing, interesting, and important, really important process that we're, we're going through. But I think that another thing that's happening is that it's not only demography, it's also mindset. So the majority, I would rather say, I would, uh, I would say Ashkenazi, liberally, liberal, mostly secular, center of Israel, okay? The, the, the majority um, still feel the majority, or in many, in many cases, the mindset is still of a majority when they interact, when they, when they, you know. And the minorities, by the way, are, are still in a mindset of minority. It doesn't matter, for example, that the religious Zionists are now uh, all over the leadership roles in the ministries, in the army, and so on. If you talk to them, they're not, they, do not, they do not feel as the hegemony or the elite. They still, in, m many of them are still in a mindset of, of minority. So wh what what is required in, in order to create, you know, a sense that, you know, we're no longer a majority, we're no longer a minority, but rather kind of equal parts or, you know, partnership, building partnerships. It's, it's a painful, by the way, it's a painful.
painful process for many. The Mizrahi movement, um, you know, m many of the Mizrahi activists were all about, you know, kind of uh, uh, replacing the Ashkenazi elite and becoming the next elite. I personally don't think that that will be the, the new narrative of Israel. It should and shouldn't. But I do think that there is a role and voice for, for everybody to come up with new kind of partnerships. So, your organization kind of deals with people who are different from throughout the society. Your organization kind of deals with these four categories sort of in the way that was defined in the little film that we saw, which is like these four categories defined by educational systems that are different. And yours is like a racial or sort of racially historic organization and dealing with it that way. And I mean, I think it's also sort of internationally, I mean, the LGBT discussion maybe in the United States is 10 years older or 20 years older than it is in Israel, but we also, I grew up in Boston, I mean, nobody was gay in my high school, that's clear. And, you know, I didn't even understand that that world existed until later in my life. So this is not a conversation America's been having for 40 years either. Maybe we're 20 years ahead of Israel. If we are 20 years ahead of Israel, I feel like that what's happening in the United States now is a backlash of like the white man who feels threatened. The majority, the Ashkenazi, maybe in Israel. And I guess my question to you three, because you are from such coming from different approaches to what you're trying to make equality or how you're trying to bring diversity, are you anticipating that energy in Israel? Is it happening? Is there like an Ashkenazi backlash against this feeling that? There's all these different voices, and everybody wants a piece of the pie. Like, is that is that kind of gonna is that manifesting um, itself in any way? Is that a conversation you anticipate? Or are you trying absolutely to? Absolutely, yes. Um, I can say I think um, my family is a very good example. Um, we're in a group of friends, so I can be a non PC. So, uh, so my father is, is a third generation in Alal. It's like a classic uh, Jewish secular family. And my mother is a, she's a playwright in Israel, and she's a, very well known in Israel. Very but, but she's a very extreme left wing. She she's, she doesn't consider herself a Zionist. Like she really believes in. A, she doesn't understand why we need a Jewish country. She's like, a, and at several points, and and my parents really proud at me that trying to deal with Israeli problems, but as. Parents, they don't understand what I'm doing. Like, why are you doing that? It's, they still feel that, you know, we, we, the Jewish secular people, we built the state of Israel, and now other groups are trying to ruin everything. They wouldn't tell it that way, but this is like the subtext of what they're saying and from, from different perspectives. And it's um, like, and I'm not saying if they are right or not, but it just, it's, it is a discourse. They feel that, and the reason I mentioned that my mother is a playwright because there was a big thing in Israel in the past year and a half, there was a new Ministry of Culture, and she's from the, the Likud party, and her agenda is about getting all this uh, old elite out of the budgets for theater and dance companies and that stuff, and bring a uh, new culture, which is more Mizrahi, more religious culture, ultra-Orthodox culture, and, but, but mainly Mizrahi and like the new... And my mother feels, and, and like this new ministry of culture, she's a... How do they call it? Uh, how do they call it? She's a character. She's, she's not a... She's um, out. But the, the heart of what she's saying, I need to agree with her, with her because the, the demography in Israel is changing. And I really feel that it's a good thing that other uh, communities that didn't use to deal and uh, to have anything to do with culture are now rising. She's doing it in a very bad way, but, but the, the, the heart of what she's saying, I actually agree with her. And my mother thinks that it's disaster that this well, is what I'm I think, saying. I think that's my point, is that your mother is like the person who has the power and right. feels the threat of sharing. I mean, sharing means that the yeah, person who exactly. has all the pie is, is now going to have less pie. And it's not just this, you know, it's not just that she, she feels threatened, 
she feels it's not right. And I have a lot of arguments with her because I'm saying, why should you be the only one that gets Israeli budgets for theater? And so within your organization, like how are you, is that, can you see that growing? And is there a way to shape that into the way that you're trying to get equality? Is there some way to engage that conversation better than I feel like we engage it here? Because there's a lot of anger growing here that I feel like nobody's really it, dealing with. It's a lot on the very, very small, it's like, on, you find it in little details. And this is why I think there are no huge solutions. We need, you know, the, the, the small issues. So um, my organization share uh, part of what what we're doing. We have a big space downtown Jerusalem for artists and people from startup. It's a kind of a very creative community center, and it's very diverse. We have quite a lot of ultra orthodox artists that we brought them that we brought there, and that raises a lot of questions. So a few weeks ago, some of the ultra orthodox painters noticed that the secular painters from the studio just next to them have uh, a naked model once a week on Tuesdays. And they said, and they were very polite, and they, they came to me and said, listen, we feel uncomfortable that this thing is happening here. And, and so I went to speak with the sound people, my staff and the secular painters, and they said, wow, this is art, like we, we can, this is the end of the country, the minute that we'll start to and, and I told them, like, this is an example of something. We, I'm not saying we need to cancel it, but we need to think about creative solution to really, to really be in the, same, in the same building. And to me, it's just an example of the fact that this is how we solve it. If we'll just feel that we need to take care of our own needs, there is no future for Israel. I think that we need to educate the people to think about the other three minorities and to not feel that if you're doing something for the other, for the needs of the other tribe, it doesn't mean that your tribe is, is losing. And, and I think it's the same in America, the same in the big issues in Israel, and the same with the small issues and people that are engaging money. Yeah, I, mean, I want to add maybe that I think that we are also still experiencing some of the backlash from the other direction. I'm not in Israel, but I would say that in some ways there's a lot of similarity between the lower income Mizrahi voters who vote for Netanyahu, vote against their economic interests voting for Netanyahu, with, with the lower, lower class, lower economic folks in this country who are now supporting Donald Trump. Who are, do they feel condescended to by the, by the elites, much in the way the Mizrahi community is felt condescended to by the Ashkenazi elite. And so they're willing to vote for somebody like Netanyahu, whose policies sort of run against their own interests in a way economically, but yet somehow they're, it's sort of like a protest vote against this, against this condescension that they have felt. And on the LGBT side, you know, the, yes, Israel has made progress. Some of Israel is actually even ahead of us, like in being able to be in the army, which they had for the last 20 years, and we just got to a few years ago. But it's also kind of a fragile thing. It's mostly been about Supreme Court decisions and not legislation from the Knesset. And as the religious sector is growing, both the Haredi and the religious Zionist sector, there are more and more rabbis who are becoming emboldened to say all kinds of awful things in the press and in the media about the LGBT community. And so it also seems like there's some there's sort of some backlash, like the Ashkenazi secular community has sort of forced this LGBT equality view on the society, and people are becoming more emboldened now to speak out against it. So I think. I think there's still that old, there's still some of the backlash from where we were, you know, before we're going to get to together with some of the new backlash that we're talking about. I think that then, uh, and a point of view of the ATP in Israel, I think we are, our um, challenge, our fighting is like very basic, for basic rights, okay, we're not there yet even. Uh, to mean, um, uh, that today we are fighting for, a, a, to, be a, to get an equal opportunity in Israel. The current uh, of public opinion in Israel toward Ethiopian Israeli that they are under capability to do this job or that job, and they don't. They are should be the, you know, the, the last one in the in the line to ask to be in this position or in that position. And if you are there to, you know, to shout or to, to, to say something, so we will remind you that you are, you know, the last in, uh, on the line. So and what we are really true to the. What we are trying to do through India, how to say we don't need to, to say things to no one. We are there to say it for 
because it's our country, we, we should get the same cost like any others in Israel. And we're doing that in a very um, uh, smart way or, you know, uh, uh, to, be, to bring different communities to sit together, Ethiopian Israelis and, you know, this, uh, uh, um, uh, people, uh, Ashkenazi or Sephardi, whatever, that they are living the Israel society and to be aware of each other and to know each other, by, you know, face to face without any barriers. And then once they know each other, it's, you know, the, the, the all barriers are you know, falling. I have a strange suggestion to you, uh, because I think you're correct. When when I think of the L LGBT community, it does have connections to all the different work groups, including the American community, obviously. Mm -hmm. And m mainly, when they're when the articles are written in the Haaretz, my nep my nephew writes a lot of them. <laughs> okay. And in the New York Times, they're about the LGBT community. You know about how they're being treated, what's going on and there was social <coughs> and so forth. But that community, actually one of the few ones that really bridges all the various communities. And for them to maybe even have a conference, mm -hmm. talk about what, it would lo what the story would be like in Israel, for not just for them to be safe, but for the communities to be safe, for, the, for, for it be the Ethiopian, or be it the secular, or the religious, or the Haredi, if you get something mm -hmm. Haredi to come, which would be a great, a great, a great, great success. For them to actually talk about because they do it to all the communities, what they're feeling, what this what narrative would be like for unified Israel. That would be fascinating to have that actually happen. And to, and then and, and to see the LBH community not just there for themselves, but there to they want to contribute to the next picture of Israel, the 3.0 that you're talking about. Because again, with a few groups that really bring all the various sides together and to really visualize what that would be like, not just for themselves, but for but for the nation. Absolutely. That'd be fascinating. No one's, no one's done that to my knowledge. No, and I think, but that's, I think that's part of what excites us about the work that, that we are doing. Yeah. I mean, we're we'll, we'll, we'll wrap this yeah. up in a moment. I think, I guess I would just say, uh, like I'll tell you one story. When I, many, several years ago, when I met with the leaders of the, like the, the Orthodox LGBT groups yeah. in Israel, and they said to me, we have to teach our leaders in our community that we are not the other. They said, but, we can't stop with that. We have to also teach them that the women in our community are not the other, and that the Palestinians that they think of as the other are not the other. Because if we, if, we, if we just do it for ourselves, then we're not doing enough. And so I, mean, that, I was filled with so much hope and promise by, through that conversation that somehow like, could like, Orthodox gay people be the, like, the, catalyst. the catalyst for some greater change. Because right? if we're only for ourselves, like that. then that's not enough. I want my nephew to cover it in the New York Times. You can do a conference like that. That, I, I guess, that would be a work, that would be interesting, everybody here. Yeah. Um, maybe I can say one word of wrap up and a graphic one. I want to just sort of tie into what Sigal just said um, about the work that you're doing now, bringing different people together. Because I think, to maybe talk about our philosophy at the Federation, which is, I think that, that for years, we were, most of the programs we were funding were targeted to very specific communities, like early education for Arab children, or uh, helping uh, Ethiopian people write better resumes and get and, and be. And we realized that, that that work is important, but it's not enough because of the segregation. That you could be an Ethiopian person to have the best you know, the best resume and all the kinds of training, but if if the first time that the HR officer in the company is if, if that interview is the first time they're ever meeting an Ethiopian person, then they're not going to get the job. And so we have to work on these other projects that you're talking about, about somehow breaking down the silos and the barriers, and forcing people to sort of meet and work together with each other, so that, that it's, it's not the first time that when the Ethiopian person walks into the company for the job, that isn't the first time somebody there is meeting somebody who's Ethiopian. That we have to somehow figure out how to sort of break down these walls if, if we really are going to create a better Israel. So say just one more word, to say thank you to the Federation that supports us from the first day, Olivia Yafat and I think uh, help us to, to fulfill this mission in, in the ground in Israel. So this is what we are here. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.